Good morning, Riverbend. I have a simple question with which to begin. How do you ask for a favor? It seems simple, I guess, but you know this world where uh, you haven't got time and, and you can't get to pick up the kids, and so you need to call somebody and get them to do it, or, or you're, you're running low on something that needs to happen right now, so you call a friend, or any, any kind of thing that you just need done by someone else. The sociologists define a favor as something I ask you so that you end up doing what I want to have done. And they recognize that there's a whole lot of sort of sociology to this, a whole lot of psychology. And to illustrate, they find that the ways that we butter people up, the ways that we get people inclined to do the thing we want, fall into three main categories. The first is flattery. You know this one. Oh, you look nice today. Did you, did you get a new get a new haircut? You know, you look great. Have you been going to the gym? <laughs> it looks like you've lost a few. I, I don't know what's going on, but you look marvelous. I would, if you have a headshot you need, I would take it today. And the Christmas card photo, now's the time. And I, I was wondering, would you mind watching my house and my five dogs for the two weeks that my family is going to be on vacation? Right? You know this dynamic. You, you kind of butter them up, them up with compliments or some way of making them mood up, right? And then it's in for the ask. So the first one is flattery, and we all know that one. The second one is indebtedness. So you remember that time? You remember that time when I had just finished 36 hours of studying for exams, and, and I finished my exam, and I hobbled home, and I was just crawling into bed when the phone rang, and it was you, and you were a long way away, and you had lost your keys, and you asked, Alan, could you please come get me? I can't find my keys, and I'm here with my car, and I can't get home, and I stopped my snooze, and I came, and I rescued you. So I was wondering, do you mind loaning me 500 bucks? Right, so we've got flattery and we've got you owe me. And the third is simply, it's going to be good for you. I know it sounds like a lot to ask you to help me move all of my stuff from my apartment into my larger house, and, and I know that I have a full-scale barber chair that goes on the third floor and is kind of heavy, and I know that my, my things don't easily fit through the door, and that all may sound bad to you, but think of the fitness you can attain. I mean, it's like lifting this barber chair is like squats, and imagine the pecs that are going to break out when you do this. You're just, you're just going to be a specimen. So I was wondering... Maybe 6 a.m. tomorrow at my house? We use many forms of manipulation to get people to do stuff for us. Favors are a thing sociologists watch for that reason. They like things like reciprocal gift giving. Do I give you this size gift or that size gift? They like social leverage and the things that we do to make headway in relationships like that. And you know, in this realm of favors... They also know that we sort of unconsciously calibrate how much we have to pound it, kind of pile it on. How much do I need to do in order to get this person to do it? If it's, if it's just, can you, can you pick something up at the store while you're there anyway? Yeah, we don't have to lay a lot into it. But if it's a larger thing, we may have to stack. And I, I start this way because you and I have been spending with Dave Haney and then with Travis last week, we've been spending... Two, and now this is the third week with our ancient friend Paul in a letter that he wrote to Philemon, a brother of his, a co-worker of his, a fellow pastor of his. And he was asking a favor, right? He calls it a favor in the passage here that you're about to see. He calls it a favor. He says, I need to ask this favor of you 
yes, my brother Philemon, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. And then down just a little before that, he has described what it is. In verse 17, he says, uh, so if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Now, if you've been around for the couple weeks, you know that the him here is Onesimus. You see, Philemon's a fairly well-to-do guy, and he has slaves, which was kind of normal for well-to-do folks in the first century. It was heinous in our, from our perspective, but it was kind of the everyday water that he swam in. It was on the, on the teaser, on the bumper, it's, it's all the cars going in a direction. They were going in the direction of you have slaves if you're a well-to-do person. And so Philemon had slaves. And Onesimus, Onesimus, one of his slaves, who was apparently very valuable to him, decided to up and run away and may even have taken some of the family jewels with him. And now Paul has written back and said, here's what I want you to do. If you count me a partner, receive Onesimus back as a partner rather than as, what, a violator, rather than any of the other things you might choose to do with him. And so, if a sociologist were looking at the letter to Philemon, they would ask, how big a favor is this? And the way they calibrate that is, how hard does Paul work in his buttering up? How, how much does he go out of his way to make sure he pulls the levers that are going to get the favor, favor done for him? And you know what he does here? He runs the table. All three of our three. We've heard him along the way. On the first one, flatter Philemon. He says in his opening prayer, Oh, I thank my God every time I mention you. I'm so refreshed by your spirit and by the things you do for all the saints. And you have refreshed the hearts of all the children of God. In fact, that last one I looked up in the King James Version just for fun. And heart in the 17th century was bowels. So you have refreshed the bowels of the saints. Try that one on. See if you can become a bowel refresher. The, Paul throws in the flattery and lays it on in his opening prayer and kind of frames it in the letter. And he also, he also pulls the you owe me card. He also pulls the indebtedness card. He, he steps in about two-thirds of the way through the letter. He steps in, and it was Paul's custom, it was Paul's custom to dictate his letters. He'd have a buddy come, even when he was in prison, he'd have somebody come, and he'd dictate, and the other person would write. Apparently he had something wrong with his eyes, and it was big letters, and, and so somebody else wrote. Well, he stops that writer and, and steps in and says, this is I, Paul, writing. I want to assure you I will pay any damages that Onesimus has, has incurred with you, right? And I won't even mention that you owe me your very soul. That's a you owe me, right? That, that you wouldn't be Christian if it weren't for me. Paul gave birth to him in Christ Jesus. Paul was the one who shared the gospel with him. Paul probably the one who baptized him, right? Paul is pulling rank here in a way, but he's certainly saying, you owe me. So he's got flattery and he's got, uh, and he's got indebtedness. And then third, he lays on, it'll be better for you. I don't know if you noticed as we've read through this, but, but Paul says, you know what? Here's the deal. If you accept Onesimus back instead of punishing him or doing something horrible to him, if you accept him back, you get a brother and maybe even a partner out of the deal. Right? Paul is pulling out all the stops, which tells you and me and tells sociologists this is a big ask. And so we're going to ask together today, what makes it such a big ask? What makes it such a hard favor for Paul to expect that Philemon might answer? And uh, to do that, it's going to take some work, so let's pray for help. We pray with me. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I thought... Travis did a marvelous job last week of reminding us that the status of an ancient slave was that of a tool, of property, of a thing that was utile, that was useful, right? But that had no rights or no say or sway in any way with their owner, right? 
They were tools, and so you could get in trouble for keeping someone's tools. And so in Roman law, as we'll see in this slide, in Roman law, since a person was defined as a tool, there's this great fresco showing slaves kind of doing their job. A man who conceals a runaway slave is a thief. Notice not a kidnapper, a thief. Thieving is what you do with things. Kidnapping is what you do with people. So, so as Travis reminded us last week, uh, slaves were property without much recourse. But they're more than that, because here, as I read further into Roman law on this, it turns out that runaway slaves show up in the law a little like pets or livestock, because frankly, tools can't run away, right? Screwdrivers don't get up and leave. I'm not much of a tool guy myself. In fact, we have a toolbox in our family, but it came from Liz, not from me. She brought it into the marriage. And if I ever say, hey, hey, no, no, what? I'll, I'll fix that, we just both laugh, right? Because I'm just not that kind of fix-it guy. And, but, but what I think about is my computer. My computer is my, my most important tool. I've got a laptop, and I do everything on it. If it gets gone, I have problems. But you know what? It can't walk off on its own. If it's lost, it's usually me leaving it somewhere. So law has to treat slaves as more than just inanimate tools, of course. And they end up looking more like pets or livestock. So that you know how, what happens when we, when we lose a dog or cat, when our dog or cat kind of scampers away, what do we do? We put posters up on telephone poles and such, right? Saying, uh, we're missing Tabby or we're missing Fido. Uh, if you get in, you know, if you happen to see them, here's a nice fetching picture, will you please call us, or will you, you right, we, we, put, we put posters up, to they did that in the ancient world with slaves, right, they would put a poster up, but in their case, it wasn't exactly like the milk carton uh, missing child thing, or the missing dog or cat thing, it was more like a wanted poster, right, almost like a wanted dead or alive poster. They put the whole town on search, and they would search other people's property with impunity. The law says if, you're, if your slave runs away, you have a right to go on anybody's property, property and scour in order to find. Right? So there are a whole lot of legal ways that owners of slaves get to get them back when they're runaways. But unlike cats or dogs or even horses who mostly want to be taken back to the home that's familiar to them. Slaves would do almost anything not to be taken back. They would do almost anything not to be taken back to their home. And so we get in the next slide a, a law right from ancient Rome, and this is Russell Crowe as gladiator, because Ancient slaves, if they could get away, would run away to the gladiator games and try to anonymously sort of sign on before they were caught. So the law was written, a runaway slave cannot escape his owner's power, even if he volunteers for the arena and subjects himself to its dangers, which presents so great a risk to his life. For a rescript of the deified pious says that such slaves should always be returned to their owners, whether before they fought with wild beasts or after. People, slaves, were willing to risk their life and limb in kind of just violent gladiator shows rather than go back to their domestic setting. Right? This wasn't a thing you wanted to be. And if they were kind of tools and they were kind of treated as pets, they were certainly owned by someone without much recourse. And unless this, unless this starts to sound ancient and brutal, we should remind ourselves that 1850 is when the Fugitive Slave Act was in, enacted by our Congress, and it sounds a lot like these draconian ancient laws, right? And as Dave reminded us the first week, there's a whole lot of different forms of slavery going on in our time. So sadly, it's not quite as remote as we would hope it is and and beyond slavery there are all kinds of things that move forward what Dave would call that one-way street of 
the hierarchy of dominance, the system of domination among us, whether it's slavery or other, we have this tendency to ascend and put other people under us. So, let's review. Paul is a felon for harboring Onesimus. Onesimus, throughout the law, is to be returned by whatever means, and he can be done with as the master pleases when he gets home. Right? So is this a big ask? It's a huge ask. And it even goes beyond helping Philemon, or Philemon helping Paul and Onesimus, because there's a whole system that holds this whole thing in place. And I want to show you a jewel that was commissioned by Augustus Caesar. Isn't it beautiful? Right? But if you look closely, it gets less beautiful because the top is the realm of the gods and the elites. Right? The people who have, in the Roman Empire, sit with the gods in sort of this leisure and there's a, there's a bird that looks very healthy and all of these people, basically it's peel me a grape land. And the people on top are, are all set up, but they're set up because the people on the bottom are living excruciating toil. See them? Those are the slaves and the others who are propping up a way of life for the, for the people who kind of banquet with the gods. And in 17 BC, Augustus even announced that this was going to be the good news, the gospel of the new Rome that he was setting up. Namely, I've got great news for you, top-rung people, it's going to get better and better for you. But of course, it wasn't good news for everybody. So Philemon is on that top row. Is this a hard ask? He's bucking, Paul is bucking the whole system of hierarchies. And, and the slave laws are just a part of it. It's a tough ask. In fact, I'm going to suggest that Paul is asking Onesim, or Paul is asking Philemon to do something that is veritably godlike. Let me explain. The concept of grace is prevalent in Christian teaching. You hear about it a lot from Dave. You hear about it a lot in Bible studies. You hear about it a lot every time Christianity rears its head because it's kind of central to what we do. But in this world, grace is threatening. Because as Paul writes in a whole lot of places, God has the prerogative to punish as God wishes. God is Lord of all, after all, not just over a certain set of number of slaves. And, and so God is master of everything. God has full right, if you and I cross God, to come back at us with punishment of any sort. Right? But the God of the universe decides not to do that. Uh, as Paul puts it in Romans 5, uh, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. In another place, uh, a, there may be people who would die for a good person, but, but not many would die for somebody who's shady. God shows God's own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And then it comes to kind of a capsule in Ephesians 2. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. You and I go off track, and God decides not to punish us. You and I step away from the line, and, you and, I, and God decides not to punish us. God kind of turns upside down the system of hierarchy and dominance in fact, Jesus comes as a lowly man, born in a stable, comes not to a palace, but to a poor family, and turns things upside down, right? So the paradox of grace, God's willingness not to use power against us, but to use power for us, kind of floats against this hierarchy. And when you and I get involved in it, it looks like a, a parable that Jesus spoke in Matthew 18. He told the story of the unforgiving servant. You see, this servant 
was low on cash, and in fact, he had big ideas about what he was going to do, and so he asked to borrow a whole lot of money, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, and his master gave it to him. And then when the servant couldn't pay, he just was at a loss, he went in and begged his master to forgive the debt, and, and the master finally just forgave the debt, and the servant went out, and a guy who owed him a few bucks was outside, and he laid into him and wouldn't forgive him that debt. Jesus said, this is not what the original gift was intended for, right? This kind of forgiveness of a debt is supposed to roll through. There's supposed to be a kind of contagion. So it's not just we're good with God. It's that grace moves in our lives and it changes the way we are in community. It changes the relationships we have so that we don't live out of powerful places. We live out of serving places. The contagion of grace is an awfully mighty thing. Right? One of the best pictures that I've ever seen of it appeared at first in a very confusing three-word online campaign. The three words were simply, be the bishop. Be the bishop. It came out of nowhere. It appeared on, on, first on social media. It was 2012. It appeared on social media. It appeared in blogs. It appeared in sermons. It appeared in devotionals. Be the bishop. And people were confused by this. They didn't know if it was a chess thing. Does this mean I've got to move diagonally, right? The bishop in chess only moves that way. Or, or does, it, does it mean I have to be celibate, right? Maybe some bishops are celibate. Maybe that's part. Be the bishop. It turns out it was an offshoot of, of the wonderful musical Les Mis as it appeared with Hugh Jackman and Russell Crowe and Anne Hathaway and the whole gang. Because in it, there's a scene with a bishop. You see, Jean Valjean, whose story Les Mis tells, Jean Valjean was a man who was thrown in prison for 20 years for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. It's a long story, but he, he's thrown into, into jail, and then it exacerbates because he misses some kind of parole thing. But he, he's in for 20 years for stealing a loaf of bread. He finally, after those years, gets his yellow card of release, and he thinks, I'm free, I'm free. But he goes everywhere and tries to find a job and tries to find a place and can't find anything, and he's getting more and more emaciated. Hugh Jackman plays him masterfully. He's getting more and more emaciated, can't find food, and there isn't a net to fall back on. So finally, almost sort of cynically, he shows up at the bishop's house. And the bishop lavishes him with a, a marvelous dinner and all the hospitality. He ends up uh, feeding himself fully for the first time in months. And the bishop says, no, stay here. And he, he puts a bed in his own room, so the bishop is over here, and, and Jean Valjean is here, and they go to get rest. And Jean Valjean is tired, don't get me wrong, but he can't sleep, and, and the bishop falls into the sleep of the just and is fine. Jean Valjean looks over and sees that this, the bishop is sleeping well, and he, he realizes that over on the table are these valuable silver items, goblets and, and other things that, that are going to be worth money, and he hasn't quite gotten over his zero-sum view of the world, and, and so he, he quietly sneaks over and gets a bag and throws these in gently, one by one, takes the silver from the bishop who has helped him. He's biting the hand that has literally just fed him, but he can't think of doing anything otherwise. He knows there's food in this, so he makes his escape but of course it's inevitable. These, these constables are on the lookout, not only for the silver, but on the, uh, for Jean Valjean, and, and they catch him, right? The constables catch him, and the next morning they return him to the bishop's house. And they come barging in the door, and they, they throw the silver into the middle of the, of the floor in front of the bishop, and they throw Jean Valjean next to it, and they say, we caught him with the silver, we, we found it. He had the nerve to say that you gave it to him. Then there's a big silence. It's a big, long silence. And Jean Valjean is watching his life. It's going to go one way or another, and it's all up to the bishop. And the bishop can pull rank. He's the power of the church, and he's just been stolen from. His, his 
kind behavior has been treated with ingratitude, he could come down on Jean Valjean and Jean Valjean would never see the light of day again. But the bishop, after he hears, he had the nerve to say you gave them these things. He answers back, yes, that's right. And seeing the skepticism on the constable's faces, thinking he's just covering for the guy, he says, but my friend, you left so early. Seems like something slipped your mind. And then he goes over and grabs the candlesticks, these priceless silver candlesticks, and brings them back over and hands them to Jean Valjean. He says, you forgot I gave these also. Would you leave the best behind? And in that moment, grace landed. Jean Valjean thought he was in for death and he had life. Jean Valjean thought he was in for, for prison and he had freedom. And all that was left was for the bishop to say, unshackle this man and send the constables away with his blessing. And it could have ended there, but the bishop knew better. The bishop continued, but remember this, my brother. See in this a higher plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. Right? What does grace do to us? Grace, when it lands, makes us gracious. And that may sound like a quid pro quo. Okay, I'll give you this. I'll give you this, this hospitality. I'll give you this grace if I'm the bishop. But you've got to do this and this and this to get it. No, no, no. Grace offers an invite into the larger life that comes with more grace. And indeed, the rest of the, the musical, the rest of Les Mis, is about how much this grace landed with Jean Valjean, how much his life became a giving out, a generosity that bucked the, the powers of sort of domination, that, that moved against the picture of what you do with means and money. He accrued and then he supported and helped anywhere where somebody was lacking, anywhere where somebody was down, anywhere that he could possibly generate the kind of generosity that had been shown to him. Friends, that's what grace does. It makes us different and it works against the structures that put us beneath one another by force. You know, all this leads around to what Paul might do if he were in the room today. And you know, you know that if he were in the room today, Paul would ask a little favor. And he might start by giving us a compliment. He might start, oh, you, you all look nice. And these musicians, they're great, aren't they? And, and by the way, I don't tell many churches this. In fact, don't tell anybody, but Riverbend's my favorite, Right? And then he might say, and by the way, I spent most of my adult life racing around the Mediterranean basin, planting churches that ended up making way for you to be here on a Sunday morning, and I wrote half the New Testament. Hello? You owe me. But then he would go long on that third thing. It is to your benefit. He would say, you all, come on in to the contagion of grace. Come on in. It's larger than any life you've known. Once you get this grace, you can't help but move it on and your life gets knit into a large project of God to break down structures of dominance, to move healthy community into play, to celebrate brother and sisterhood, to be gracious. So I was wondering, Paul would say, if you could maybe do something godlike? I was wondering if you could maybe be the bishop. I was wondering if you could repay evil with good. I was wondering if you could love your enemy and pray for your persecutor. I was wondering if you could receive grace. Amen. Amen.